Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here doing another movie review in October since it's Halloween month. This time it's a supernatural horror film that came out on February 12, 2010, simply called The Wolfman. It's a remake of the 1941 horror classic with Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, playing Lawrence Talbot, who just came to his ancestral town to bury his deceased brother who may have been attacked by a wolf and then soon he will wind up being attacked by the wolf and offers a a werewolf curse where he's going to transform in the full moon at night yeah. and this version uh, features um, Benicio Del Toro in the role of, of Lawrence Talbot who will soon become the Wolfman uh, with uh, Anthony Hopkins uh, playing Sir John his father and Emily Blunt uh, playing Gwen which happens to be his brother's um, fiance but now he will soon become Talbot's love interest well, of course she came to town to to help him and we also got Hugo Reven playing the inspector who's about to find out about the creature that's uh, going around the town of London anyway <laughs> This Blu-ray edition that I picked up uh, just recently at uh, Best Buy, um, which is a reissue, because it came out uh, on Blu-ray and DVD uh, back when this movie came out. Uh, just the same year, though, granted. And uh, this contains uh, both the unrated director's cut. Um, Yes, Joe Johnston directed this movie, the same man who gave us uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, uh, The Rocketeer, Captain America, The First Avenger, and so, and even Jumanji. Yes, he also directed Jurassic Park Free. And so this was the longer cut of the movie, whereas it does contain the theatrical version, which is the one that came out in theaters, uh, which was cut down. It was a faster pace uh, one that I saw. Um, I, I saw it numerous of times. Um, I didn't see it in theaters though, but I did actually saw it later. Um, especially um, on Cinemax. I taped it off. I think it was Cinemax or it was HBO, but it might have been Cinemax. And I watched the movie and I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's it doesn't go on top of the original 1941 classic because in fact no other film would top that but still uh, it was well done for what it was going for I mean for the performances they, they definitely portrayed it very well I mean but sadly uh, when the film came out it was a box office bomb yeah, it didn't do very well, mostly because, you know, Avatar was a big hit when it came out. It, that's true. In fact, it also came out on the same weekend as Valentine's Day and Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief. Because of that, yeah, it bombed. And they were very struggling to find a release for this movie. And not only that, but they were also having a lot of... Um, a lot of problems going around when they were going to do this movie and do this version. Uh, they were struggling so hard. I think it had to do with studio interference or something like that. Um, of course, uh, originally it was going to be directed by Mark uh, Womanek, uh, the same director who, of course, did films like One Hour Photo and Never Let Me Go and has done a lot of music videos of any kind. But he left weeks uh, before filming because of uh, creative differences that he has to do. Um, there might have been a reason why he was doing that movie. And it was also because they had budgetary issues happening. So Joe Johnson was hired to do the job only for four weeks. Um, they had a film 
for like I think 80 days as, as it's told but they had to do a lot of reshoots um, for the extended production around I think that's probably how they have to get you know both cuts to be included they weren't so sure which cut they were going to choose and they had trouble trying to find the composer for the movie um, they were of course getting Danny Elfman to, to compose but he was briefly replaced by Paul uh, Haslinger which at that point on I mean they thought they were going to use him to see if he'll give it a more chilling score but that didn't work out so they went back to Elfman again so it really had a trouble production as it seems and yeah it got negative reviews but it got mixed reviews from other people too um, which is a shame because I, I think this movie is a lot better than than what the critics gave and what's amazing though was that um, they had uh, the special makeup effects by none other than legendary Rick Baker so he actually created the effects of the the Wolfman you know there's actually two by the way well there's a sequel behind that <laughs> but he did a great job you know creating the effects of that considering the fact that they did use um, the digital effects by women and Wibberman Hughes the same people that gave us Ghostbusters yeah they worked on that but they did the digital effects of the transitions the transforming of the Wolfman you know with with all the bones uh, cracking you know shape shifting you know with the faces and all I mean wow it was very creepy how they did it but I know they also did use digital effects for the animals mostly the the bear and, and the deer. Luckily not the dog though. <laughs> so yeah. But they did kept it as they could. And as we all know, uh, Rick Baker, which I know he won several Oscars, but surprisingly he won the Oscar for the makeup effects of this movie. Joining in with um, makeup effects supervisor Dave uh, Elsley. So. So yeah, they won an Academy Award for Best Makeup for the 83rd Academy Awards at the time. Yeah, which I didn't bother to watch because I know I heard it was terrible. But then again, 2010 was a lousy year. Though there were some great movies that came out. So. And the ones that I do love but the ones I just don't care for. Even ones that were overrated or whatever. Anyway, this movie... Um, has bonus features, um, has two alternate endings. Uh, it's a dead giveaway, but it's basically the scene where uh, the Wolfman, Lawrence Talbot, who was played by Benicio del Toro, uh, was ready to attack uh, Gwen. And Gwen was trying to let him know that it's her. Just before she was about to grab the gun, I mean, she almost fell off of the cliff you know, the waterfall in the neck of the woods, but apparently she was about to shoot him so with the silver bullet, so then he was going to transform to his old self. Well, one version had her getting attacked by the wolfman, and then later shot him. So he was killed, probably transformed, and it just goes directly into the full moon, and then the next ending, which is similar to this, uh, this time, yeah, she just got attacked and then she died eventually. Um, and then the Wolfman lives, unfortunately. So it kind of set up for like a sequel bait ending, but that will never happen. Anyway, it has deleted and extended scenes. Uh, one of the... Uh, extended scenes that they had was um, this was interesting was when Lawrence Talbot had transformed once again as the Wolfman um, inside the the asylum where he goes around attacking all the the doctors around and, and all he, he wants up escaping 
throughout the entire town of London. He goes all the way straight into the opera house where you get to see this uh, blind operetta you know, singing and there's basically a masquerade party going around so they didn't see the notice until he goes around attacking one of the guests and then the wolfman was ready to attack her but the inspector who was of course played by Hugo Reeman was chasing after him along with the rest of the cops and <clears throat> and was ready to stop him. Luckily the blind operetta didn't get killed, thank goodness. But then the next scene, uh, there was a bit of a <laughs> a puppet feeder right there where they were playing the Little Red Riding Hood and then suddenly the the puppeteers uh, got eaten alive by the wolfman and kind of scared all the kids off. I mean, <laughs> crazy scene. So I know why they couldn't use that scene in the movie, but it would have been cool. And has all the other feature threats uh, of all the the creativity that they were behind of. You know, with, you got the cast and the crew, and and how they created the Wolfman, and all, and all the transformation secrets, uh, Wolf and Middle East. I mean, you get them all. Yeah, the unrated cut is a lot longer than than the theatrical cuts. Um, it was two hours, but yeah, hour and fifty nine minutes. But the theatrical cut is only an hour and forty three minutes. So I can see why it was cut down somehow. Um, but I, I felt like this was much underappreciated uh, when it came out, and it's very underrated. It doesn't deserve a lot of hate it gets. Okay, it won't again. It won't top the original nineteen forty one classic, and never will. But that still doesn't mean that this movie's bad. I've seen worse remakes out there too. Even the worst horror remakes we had, even such as let's say by the year of 2010, there was a Nightmare on Elm Street. Tell me this, I would rather watch The Wolfman over that. Exactly. I mean, even Let Me In is better than than a Nightmare on Elm Street remake. And that's a great remake, too. So, I, I really don't understand. Because it did have a great cast here. And a great setting. And it does give it this dark feel to it. I also love how the unrated cut had the original, or which was updated at this point on, but it had the Universal Variants, where it had the, uh, the classic 1940s um, Globe Deco that they used, you know, where where you could tell it was done by glass and it says a universal picture with all the stars uh, rolling around on the background. You know what I'm talking about. It's that classic logo. And Relativity Media uh, co-produced the film with Stuber Pictures. So, perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay, and you want to see what the disc looked like, uh, which is upside down. Huh. Yeah. Just a clear uh, cover artwork that's all in blue. Oh, there you go. So let's begin. It stars Benicio del Toro, as you may remember him from films like The Usual Suspects, uh, S's Baggage, um, The Hunted, uh, among many others that he's done in his career. And he's a great actor. Uh, with Mario Marine Baracas. Anthony Hopkins, yeah, the legendary actor who's been in movies where he plays uh, the legendary <laughs> uh, cannibalistic, you know, Hannibal Lecter in the Signs of the Lambs and Hannibal, as well as uh, uh, Red Dragon, and he's done a lot of great movies too in his career, you know, like The Elephant Man, The Bounty. Um, you name it. Emily Blunt, uh, who was in Sunshine Cleaning with Amy Adams. And I know she was in movies like uh, Edge of Tomorrow with Tom Cruise. She was in the most recently Jungle Cruise with Dwayne Johnson, aka The Rock. I haven't seen it, but I'll get to it later. 
And she was also in the movie um, Mary Poppins Returns, where she plays uh, Mary Poppins, you know, taking over for Julie Andrews. So, Hugo Reven, as you may remember him in the movie The Matrix, <laughs> along with its sequels, where he always goes around saying, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> And he was also in the movie B for Vendetta, too. And, of course, uh, The Avengers of uh, Priscilla. Uh, Geraldine uh, Chaplin, who, um, believe it or not, was actually the daughter of Charlie Chaplin, yeah, the legendary. But he's done a lot, a lot of stuff in her career. Art Malik, as you may remember him from, as the villain in True Lies, and he was also... A villain in, in the movie City of Joy with Patrick Swayze and has done a lot of work. Uh, Anthony Shear, uh, David Schultzfield, um, David Stern, Simon Morales, uh, Asa Butterfield, yes, who went on to do the movie Hugo along with Ender's Game. Um, Christina Contes, uh, Michael Cronin, Nicholas Day, Clive Russell, uh, Roger Frost, and interesting enough, uh, we have cameo appearances by Max von Sydow, the legendary actor who's sadly no longer with us. Um, but of course, he was in films like Needful Fiends, uh, Hawaii. Um, he was in the movie Strange Brew, you know, with Bob and Doug McKenzie, <laughs> as you know, and many others in his career. Um, yes, even um, they got Rick Baker to play a part as the Gypsy Man. And believe it or not, uh, they actually got the Wolfman's Howling uh, voice sequences. It's done by, you wouldn't believe this, rock singers Gene Simmons and David Lee Roth. Yes, from Kiss and Van Halen. And they even did the, the impressions of, of the animals and the opera singers. I thought, wow, I didn't know they used it, these guys. That's cool. <laughs> okay. It's written by Andrew Kevin Walker. Yes, the same writer who gave us Seven, as well as Sleepy Hollow. He also wrote uh, Eight Millimeter with Nicolas Cage with David Self, and it's directed by Joe Johnston, who's done several works of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Jumanji, Captain America, The First Avenger, and more. <laughs> the movie began set in 1891 in an industrial town called Blackmore. We meet Ben Tabbitt, who's played by Simon Morrell, who had been murdered by a wolf-like creature that had to be maintained mysterious. Therefore, his brother, a Shakespearean actor named Lawrence Talbot, who's played by Benicio del Toro, had returns home after receiving a letter from Ben's fiance, Gwen Cuntliffe, who's played by Emily Blunt, to inform him about Ben's disappearance. Uh, this is where, in the unrated version, he is performing Hamlet uh, in front of the whole stage. And he was just ready to continue to go around the town to, to perform some more uh, Shakespeare acts um, on stage, everywhere. But he wasn't so sure if he was going to return home, so apparently he had to think about it until it was time. So he took the train to Blackmore where he meets this elderly old man uh, who's played by Max von Sydow, who just gave him a wolf cane. Um, he wasn't going to have the cane, but apparently he left it with him uh, while he was asleep. And then when he got to Blackmoor, you know, he, he finally returned home. He reunites with his extraneous father, Sir John, played by Anthony Hopkins. So, of course, this was, as it continues, it was edited down for the theatrical version instead of having to show it in the underrated cut. But he informs him that Ben's body has already been mutilated. And he actually found a medallion that just came from a gypsy. So at the local pub, 
Lawrence overheard the locals believing that it was a wild animal that was attacking him. But many had, especially what happened 25 years earlier, about all the other deaths uh, involving all the other attacks going around. But many had blamed the gypsies who were camped outside of town, while others had claimed that there had been similar murders that occurred 25 years earlier. Um, then he started to have flashbacks as he tours his family's home. When he was a young boy, he found out that his mother, Jolana, had seemingly committed suicide, and his father was standing over her dead body as he was sent to Lambeth Hospital in London a year later, uh, for a year, and was having suffered from delusions uh, that connects to the event that was going to happen. Then uh, Lawrence visits the gypsies during a full moon, and I also learned that he does have his servant named Singh, who's played by Art Malik. Sir John isn't the only person who's going to go around, you know, hunting for the creature. Yeah. So Lawrence, so the local townspeople had raided the camp to confess it by using a dancing bear, and they believe that it was the killer. But it turns out that yes, the wolf eventually came on the loose and winds up attacking everyone, and then. He was going to continue to contact the rest of the gypsies. So Lawrence came to help try to stop uh, this wolf that's, that's continuing to, to run around until later he got caught. He was about to save the, the young boy who just ran away. And he got attacked by the wolf and, and actually got bitten completely directly into the, the neck. And... So now uh, a gypsy woman named Olivia, who's played by Geraldine Chaplin, had suited uh, Lawrence's neck wounds, and another gypsy insists that the now cursed uh, Lawrence should be killed before he kills others. So now he's going to turn into the werewolf. Olivia refuses, saying that he'll still be a man if only he's loved by one that it can release him. So he's under the curse. He recovers naturally um, throughout maybe the entire day and night, maybe perhaps a week, and develops a heightened spell ability and senses. So now he begins to hear sensibly like loud noises and all. Like you could probably hear horses falling around that's far away from where he is. He begins to see several visions of animal instincts and all. Like he'll sense that he'll see plenty of nightmares going around that he has uh, where the wolf is going to appear. He's going to, the wolf man is going to come by, attack him. And he also seen this one creature. It had to be a demon who might have been the one who's, who actually attacked uh, the other one all the others uh, around. We also learned that Singh uh, had showed Lawrence a set of silver bullets and implies that something monstrous is on the loose in Blackmore. So that's where we meet Inspector Francis Aberlein who's played by Hugo Reven to investigate the recent killings uh, that's happening and suspects that Lawrence might be responsible for it um, based on his past. But fearing uh, Gwen's safety, he decided to have uh, her go back to London so she'll be safe over there because the whole place is cursed. So at that point on, we begin to learn the secret behind this. And, and now, by the time uh, he went down to uh, Sir John's, uh, going directly to Solana's crypt, where Sir John locks himself in the room and gives Lawrence a cryptic warning, which at this rate will lead to Lawrence's uh, painful transformation into a werewolf. So he's going to become the wolf man. But then we also learn 
another secret behind that, and this is going to be the biggest spoiler of them all, was when we found out that he's not the only one. That he, his own father actually was the Wolfman the whole time. And he's been that way ever since. And he never got... So he's doing his best trying to... Uh, to go full control and not to transform until later. So it only happens during the full moon. And therefore, yes, uh, when Lawrence had transformed into the Wolfman, that's where he goes around attacking everyone throughout the entire town. Attacks several villages around, yeah, villagers and everyone. Causing so many deaths and and then the inspector was was about to chase around this wolfman and everyone by the time he woke up it was already filled with blood and, and all his shirt has already been torn his entire clothes was uh, that's when sure John just came by and just found out that he's in bigger trouble and now the cops and, and all the doctors that just arrived and was ready to take Lawrence directly into the asylum and that's how Sir John revealed the truth that he is a, tr a wolf man himself and he's the one that causes all the murders and he was the one that's responsible for killing his mother which is his wife so now he's gonna start seeking revenge against him once he got out of the asylum, of course, he's been seeing several flashbacks, you know, of the Wolfman and, and the transitions and all all the nightmares he's been getting. He was afraid because he was under the uh, the serum that he got injected by, and he begins to see a Gwen and all. So at that rate, um, all the doctors around they they took uh, Lawrence sort of a demonstration to find out if he's going to start transforming and what she did uh, during the full moon he transformed in a very uh, incredible way where a lot of bones uh, cracking shape shifting and his face starts to change so much that he'll soon all this hair is starting to grow and that's how he's going to turn into the wolf man as we saw it and, and it has this bloody, gory scenes uh, where he, there's like head, the tapications and and all this other uh, brutal attacks around, you know, ripping off um, all the, yeah, ripping off uh, the flesh and everything going around. I mean, wow, this is brutal. And then he escapes going around the town of London. He was on top of the roof. And yes, he even howls too. Oh, at the full moon. And Inspector. Uh, and the Inspector Francis started to chase him around uh, with the rest of the cops, you know, trying to give him a warning, trying to shoot up in the air so he can escape as fast as he can before he suddenly transforms back to his normal self uh, the next night and now he just came to London where now he begins to find Gwen and now he's about to warn her that you know you need to he needs her to help him so he's gonna go straight directly to the gypsies to hoping that the curse will will go away if he can but Gwen decided to to go after him and see if maybe he'll meet one of the gypsies, which is Maleva, and he's about to let her know about how to to stop this werewolf's curse. And that's how it's going to occur, because by the time he returns uh, back home to Sir John, that's when he's going to start attacking him, which we learned that, yes, he did, he did kill some of the other people around. And that's where we led to this 
this fight scene between Sir John and Lawrence you know, as they transform into werewolves. So now we begin to find out that Sir John did transform into the Wolfman. And now they have this one big fight scene. There's the extended fight scene on the Blu-ray, by the way, so you'll get to see that if you want to see more of that. Um, but the fight scene was very incredible. And then after that, uh, he finally killed um, Sir John by by throwing him directly into um, the fireplace, and somehow he he decapitated his head. Yeah, and then he somehow transforms back to his normal self, so you see his head. And then um, he escapes and was ready to run straight to the woods, where now he's being chased down by Francis and the rest of the cops. And Gwen was already, you know, running away as fast as she could until the wolfman found her, and, and the wolfman was ready to attack Gwen before. She got the gun that has the silver bullet inside. And now this was what led to the the final ending where yes, just when the wolfman was about to attack her, she shot her him with the silver bullet and now he transforms back to his normal self and yeah, he dies. And he says it was better this way. Thank you. So, of course, Gwen lives. Um, the inspector was already attacked um, earlier, too. So he was telling Gwen to run away, too, as well. So I'm not so sure if he's going to become one, but, well, who knows. That's, that always leads to that secret. So, there we go. So, in, in my opinion... This was a good movie. It's not um, a masterpiece by some level, but it was a good film on its own right. Uh, I love the performances. Not a single bad performance whatsoever by by the entire leads of the characters. I thought Benicio Del Toro did a wonderful job portraying the Lawrence Tabbitt. I thought the way he was portrayed, I mean, you could definitely tell from his from his history that you know there's a lot of subtlety behind him and and the way he feels especially when he lost his mom and the secrets behind all this and the main reason why he, you know he left town so he can finally gain a new life as a Shakespearean actor but he was very shocked to hear about his brother who was about to marry this beautiful woman who now we led to all, all the secrets and behind all that. Uh, Anthony Hopkins, I mean, can never be this uh, chilling right here because I, I can even tell that there's a lot of twists behind his character of his estranged father, Sir John. I mean, he's a hunter himself too. I mean, he has a dog named Samson. He collects a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, animals around. I mean, apparently he studies uh, Lycon Ferrapi. Uh, he's he's been dealing with. He's been uh, practicing that for for generations. So maybe for, well for years at this point. Um, and he's beginning to find out about the secret behind him that we didn't that got revealed later. And as Hugo Rebin did a great job to playing the inspectors, trying to investigate all the brutal murderers of all the Burge villagers, gypsies, and everyone else on town that involves this creature. And they're trying to suspect the blame on one of them. Yeah, I know, I'm having trouble speaking at the moment. <laughs> um, and when. And also, Emily Blunt playing uh, Ben's fiance Gwen is just luminous, and she's beautiful. He really fell for her too after her loss, and 
At this rate, she will soon become the love interest for for Lawrence. So, I kind of fell for them. So, this is definitely a tragic love story right there. Um, uh, once again, uh, the digital effects, um, it, it can get gawky at times. I, I understand. But it doesn't bother me much uh, like some movies have. But this one was done. Um, in that particular way, I mean, I, I had to say probably the most gruesome scene was when Lawrence had transformed into the werewolf uh, during the asylum scene. I mean, you see the hands uh, starting to look, you know, very, uh, starts to break apart like this. And, you know, I'm trying to show you exactly how they did it. And, and how the face starts to uh, crack around and and how it changes so much uh, with, with his paw, hands and his paws and everything and all the hair is starting to grow too later and the face and all the aggressiveness that that really shows I mean I know it's not subtlety on the side of, of the level but but it does show the intensity of how the character is going to become so that was incredible but, of course, the, the makeup effects were very challenging. I mean, Rick Baker did an excellent job um, having to have Benicio Del Toro on the chair, you know, being put up all that makeup for, like, at this rate, four hours and a half, as it was told, to actually portray the role. They did use uh, stunt doubles uh, to create the stunts that, that both... Um, Del Toro and, and of course Hopkins had to do, especially when they had to put the makeup on Hawk, Hopkins as well to portray the uh, the Wolfman as well. Uh, even with the fight scenes uh, at the end of the movie and having to go on the rooftops for, for Lawrence to, you know, trying to get away from all these um, gun uh, gunshots from, from all the cops around, so yeah. And of course, all the brutal scenes um, of the attacks and all, um, even with the movements they use with the animals and all. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of uh, movements that went really fast, extremely. I mean, going to attack one by one with all these gruesome death scenes. Um, even the one where uh, the wolf actually uses his claws and just daggers uh, directly into this one man's face and all that claws went straight into his mouth. I was like, whoa! And all these decapitations and all these um, flesh uh, wounds just coming right out and everything. It was, wow, amazing. Very scary at times, too. So, this was well done, in my opinion. Um, I wish it was a hit, though. I, I wish it did very well for its 150 million budget, uh, but it was almost pretty close. That it only made 14 2.6 million, but I still think it could have made more. And it's not exactly as bad as you think. I, I mean, maybe they had a lot of trouble behind this. I mean, I. I guess, you know, they thought maybe they might do a sequel to this if they were going to continue. Maybe they were going to turn this into uh, a bit of a, uh, let's put it this way. You know, remember when Universal had the Dark Universe, uh, which is supposed to be their their cinematic universe for all the the monsters around, for the Universal monsters of, you know, Frankenstein, Invisible Man, you know, Dracula, Wolfman and all. Um, even Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Well, I guess this could have been the start, but that never happened. Uh, Dracula Untold, uh, that, that was another film that followed. Uh, they were going to do that, but that failed. <laughs> but then, of course, we had The Mummy um, with Tom Cruise, and we all know how that turned out. That was an instant failure. But... Nevertheless, uh, I thought this version was, in my opinion, was great. Uh, or, at this rate, good. 
just not a masterpiece as it seems. Um, and um, it does have a wonderful cinematography by Shelley Johnson and Danny Elfman um, did uh, great created a powerful score for the movie uh, even though he was originally going to be replaced but thank goodness he, they brought him back to continue with the score because they felt like it didn't work out but it, it definitely gives it this haunting score and, and all um, but it's worth the watch I mean it's not going to top the 1941 classic and it never will be I mean, no doubt about it, the original film will always be a classic, joining in with the sequels, uh, with Lon Chaney Jr., I mean, you can't go wrong with that, but as an actual uh, modern remake, it's worth it. I mean, so that's The Wolfman, and I give the movie, I'll give it four stars, why not? It, it was, it's worth it, even for its story. I mean, maybe the story could have had some subtle improvements, but if you had to watch the unrated cut, it, it does create some more build-up to the story. So, there you go. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.